The Royal Docks will never again be a major deep sea port, but it is still an area rich in people, skills and land. These unique resources could be stolen from local people. The future is up for grabs. It was music to people's ears around here to hear the blast of a ship. You don't hear it now. So what are they saying around here? It's the end. It isn't the end. It's not the end at all. Let's, let's revitalise this place. We can do. We live around here. So let's do it. People of Docklands have been trodden on since the Second World War. There have been so many promises from people like the LDDC. We will do this for you. We will do this. We will do that. Nothing is, nothing's ever come of it. People just get so apathetic because they've been promised so much. People in Duckland have been promised the earth since 1949 and look what they've got. We've got the rough end of the deal as normal. With the decline in the docks, local shops and factories have closed. The once thriving area has rapidly decayed. Local people feel forgotten, their real needs ignored. I mean, there's not a theater down there, there's not a swimming pool, there is nothing. Up to the age of about 11, 12, when you have to change and go to school. I mean, when I was at school, up until the age of 11, I went to school in Woolwich. Once I was 11, I had to travel to East Ham. They haven't even got a big school for the older children. I mean, it's a long day when you have to go out at eight and you don't go until five for an 11-year-old child. So, to my way, I think they need everything in Woolwich. They've got nothing. So they should start from scratch. Things aren't thought out, really. But, um... You, you go and have all this new development in Beckton, but there's no schools, there's no shops, there's, there's nothing for people to do. I mean, it seems to be a story down here that everything is split. This community is split off from the rest of Newham. The new housing estate is split in two because there's council one side and there's private the other side. Um, and never the twain shall meet is the impression that we get as we go around and talk to people. If it stays like what it is now, probably we'll move out later on. But if it gets any better, like things for, like if we have kids, things like that, we're better for all our, our kids. For the property speculators, the vast Royal Docks area in the middle of London is the richest piece of real estate in Britain. With profit their only motive, the London Docklands Development Corporation favours grandiose plans like the short takeoff and landing airport. But the Stolport, as it is known, will harm the local environment and is no solution to local needs. In the past, although the wealth of the docks rarely ended up in Docklands, at least the basic services were there, if only to make sure the workers got to work on time. These services are fondly remembered. Well, there used to be trolley buses, used to, and our back used to look on to the terminus, what is there now, and you get just a few buses there now, don't you? Mm. And the trolley buses used to queue up along the dock road there to go into the terminus, and there'd be thousands of these, you not only get dockies, but the uh, factory workers all used to be at the oh, same yeah, time. Keelers, they? And um, then uh, they'd all sort of fight to hurry up and get on the bus, but you didn't have the waiting for the buses like you do now, you know. It, uh, as soon as the bus was full up, it was more or less every couple of minutes they'd yeah, yeah. be going out. Not only is London the greatest metropolis of the world, but also, and above all, it is a great seaport, a marine city whose main channels, tributaries and backwaters are crammed with traffic. Traffic that passes to and from the open sea and through one of the most up-to-date dock systems in the world. Every berth was absolutely full up. Every berth, got you like to mention, was full up. A ship was there. And outside that ship, there'd be, oh, dozens and dozens of barges ready to take the cargo away. That was out what cargo went ashore. Also, the craft would be there to take it away. Uh, what we used to do, more so, where the big ships, say, so couldn't get up into London Dock or to the different wharves. The cargo would go into the craft, and the craft would be would go up, uh, and then it'd be unloaded the various wolves, all around Millwall, all around Wapping, all around Rotherhithe, right up through to Brentford, through to Brentford mm. all different types of cargo. Yeah, you name it. Tea, uh, yeah. rubber, 
tin, copper, all different sort of wine. Walls, paper. Wall, everything. Anything you like to mention or think of, we carried on in craft. There was nothing we didn't carry. All sorts of different seeds, grain, practically everything. Bowels of eye, you know. Timber. The ships await their cargoes, impatient now for the flood tide on which they must sail, carrying with them the work of a million men. The containerization of much of the cargo that came to the royals meant the Port of London had to change its strategy. In its publicity, the PLA gives the impression that it faced up to the challenge. And the Port of London Authority, its roots deep in the past, its eye firmly on the future, provides, maintains and develops every facility required by modern ships and their cargoes, thus being in the endless chain of commerce across the civilised world, the vital link. Fine words from the PLA, but they let the royals decline and now they seem more interested in the value of the land than in the industries that remain. These lighterage companies, also these shipping companies, uh, also the PLA, uh, a lot of them took profits out of the industry. I mean, that's pretty obvious. And I don't think they actually kept up with the times of ploughing money back into it. Uh, all these different wolves, they still work their old antiquated way, way of working, dating back to God knows when, sort of 1800s, I should think. They had the same cranes there, the same way, method of working, never ever brought the particular wolf frontage up to the standard of way progress went on. And until the eventual time, I suppose they must have thought, well, we're not going to spend X amount of money on rebuilding or anything like that or keeping up with the times and just drew out and that's how the decline went on and on and on. What little the PLA did invest in the royals was often ill-advised and poorly executed. Could the Stolport be remembered like this in a few years time? I mean they built three great big uh, things on the dock there, You're supposed to fetch meat out the edge. Well, they must have cost untold millions in things. And I was staying there one day and I was working along on the next berth and they wanted to shift these three of them. They wanted to shift one of them. I'm not kidding you, you couldn't hear yourself talk. The racket they made. They never ever worked. They tried them for about an hour and uh, they found out they was losing whatever cultures they was putting on, they was losing them, they was going all over the place. They never really worked. We tested it. And the maximum we ever done was about 7,000 carcasses. It cost about three and a quarter million pound to build. It was a million pound put up by the PLA, two and a quarter million pound by the Vestic Combine. And they never got as much as a normal gang of men would have done. They got 7,000 carcasses. And it finished up with two gangs of men being out all night long, clearing the bloody stuff from where it got jammed up in the multi convo system. So that, again, to me, and for they never, they listened to us, they consulted with us, but that was all. They never asked us what we thought should be done. And that still stands there, looks like a couple of bloody takeoff for rocket launches at the moment. And that's one of the plans that, if you looked at it today, and we're talking about three and a quarter million pounds, would not have helped the Port Authority to plan. missed opportunities. It was trapped in a past based on Britain's trade with its empire. As these routes from the colonies containerized, the PLA moved its investment downriver aiming to attract the new, bigger ships. It allowed the upriver docks to decline. In doing so, it missed the growing market for smaller container ships from Europe. You have places like Ireland and Wolf, right? the ship repairs and all the rest of it. I mean, they just shut them places down. One at Silvertown, one at Woolwich, two, two great big factories. Just shut them down because of the decline in the docks. The standard telephone cables, they moved them to Basildon. The people they used to employ around here, thousands, they just moved out to Basildon. Didn't care about the people that live around here. Just moved them out. 
Unless long-term employment is increased, all local resources are improved. The future looks bleak for the next generation growing up in North Woolwich. These planners don't eat half of them, don't even live in Newham. They can say, oh, you can have so-and-so. Then they go home to their country houses and we have left to suffer. And I think that the local people should have a say in what is in their area, because they've got to live there. It's their environment, they're paying their rates. And they should have a say what goes on in the dock, well, in their area, not only down Docklands, but every area. OK, I'm only a stranger here, four years I'm in this area, OK? But in those four years, I begin to realise that nobody trusts nobody around here. You tell them you've got to do this for them, they say, OK, 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 and that's about it. They get used to people promising them things and nothing happens. The LDDC, set up and funded by central government, was given far-reaching powers to regenerate the area. But it is an unelected body, meeting in secret. It seems more responsive to city businessmen than to the needs of the people of Docklands. Well, if, if the LDDC come up with the idea, it's their idea and they try and impose their ideas and just hope that everybody else will go along with it, which they don't. But if the people of Docklands come up with an idea, it's the people of Docklands who have got to live with it, and they will go along with it because, and they'll fight all the way. They'll fight bloody hard to make sure that they get it. I don't think the old DDC should be in Docklands. That land belongs to Newham, and I think it's up to the people of Newham to say what they want in there, and our councillors to say that what, they, what we want in Norm, not what the LDDC are telling us we've got to have, they're not consulting the local people, or if they are, they're consulting them when it's too late for them to do anything about it. They're not giving the people a chance to say what they want in Docklands. It's just, it's going there and that's that. The Newham Docklands Forum, backed by the GLC, set up a people's plan centre. Local people brought their hopes and ideas for the future. The forum employed five local people who talked to workers in local companies, to community groups, and to meetings in different estates. The ideas from all these sources form the basis of a plan, the people's plan. Popular planning is everybody involved. The other kind of planning is a gentleman who earns probably 25 grand a year, Mark Four Cortina, lives in Kent somewhere. But I don't see, for my mind, I don't see how someone who, with all that, can actually tell me what I need, what's good for me. I don't agree with that. And it's probably been proved time and time again in history that the people who actually live in the houses, work in the factories, could design them better than the people who say, this is what you're going to have. They could probably do it a lot better, and they just need to be given the chance. And now, through the People's Plan Centre, they've got the chance to do that. The property speculators think the Royals are only fit for the bulldozer. In fact, there are over 70 firms working there, from haulage contractors to engineering companies employing a total of nearly 800 people. A recent survey has shown that these firms don't just want to stay, they want to expand. A potential for development conveniently ignored by the LDDC. If the Stolport was built, a quarter of them would have to close. Over 80 jobs would be lost. Through the infinite wisdom that the PLA tell us they have, that ship repairs decline. They've always made it difficult for ship repair in the Royals. But there is a market for ship repair. There's hundreds of skilled people throughout Docklands on the dole looking for a job. And they've... It really what I've been doing is talking to people with the ship repair skills and saying, would you be interested if, you know, if ship repair was brought back to the Royals? And they've all said yes, 100%. I, I think that there's a very big future for it, only coming into the small shipping side. We're not looking for no 
50,000 ton ships. You're looking for the 5,000 ton maximum. And there's still a great potential for this class of ship today. It was on also on Sunday, uh, Sunday, I was even down in Poole at Bolson Shipyard. Now, they only overhaul small ships. Now, they've been busy for the last two years working seven days a week. Now, if, it, if they can manage it, then so could we up here, prov providing we had the facilities and at least the least that we can work on, not something that is only 12 months and then we've got to start upheaving everything and moving again. Joe Jackie Bate, now working in the Royals, was evicted from the Enterprise Zone in the West India docks by the LDDC. It was atrocious because uh, in moving us out they gave us an eviction notice, then they put sheriff's orders onto us, they pulled the cable from the uh, minesweeper which we were overhauling so we had no electricity on board, uh, locked a lot of our equipment up and in us moving we had to sell two cranes, two um, forklifts and various other material because the premises we have now are a lot smaller than what we had in the West India dock. But of course their policy was that our class of work wasn't compatible to what they were doing with the docks. And uh, you know even now if you go down to the West India dock there is still no progress. It's only just a wasteland at the moment and this is after 12 months being moved out. These are the workshops of Thames Ship Repair Limited, forced out when the PLA closed the dock to shipping. Shipping companies still want to use these facilities and there are workers with ship repair skills on the dole. The building and dry dock will be demolished if the airport goes ahead. It's just art rendering when you talk to people that were dockers, ship repairers and they're not working any longer. Uh, whose fault is it? That's all I want to know. It isn't their fault, is it? Somebody's at fault, but they're not. So I, I say to them now, like, you know, let's open these docks again, but not for a stole pool. That's not going to do anybody any good. The aim of the People's Plan is to build on local skills and industries by bringing together many sections of the community. The plan proposes a unique industrial development based on the area's closeness to central London and its advantages as an interchange of road, rail and water transport. With the growth in European shipping, there is a definite future for cargo handling in the Royal Docks. Anybody with any common sense, that river, really speaking, that's flowing up and down every day and every night, is the best roadway we have. Uh, been proven over the past years. Uh, it could even be proven again for the future. Because we know that ships up to 5,000 tonnes would come in here, lots of them. I mean, it's a known thing uh, that a ship can come up the river at any state of tide, come in these docks, a ship of, uh, of a certain size, come in this and turn round and be out within 24 hours. So why are they saying that they can do it at Dover? They can do it at Sheerness. We can do it here. The People's Plan involves the integration of large-scale schemes with small cooperative enterprises, such as a fisheries co-op. The water now is so clean, it has been proven that there is a considerable amount of fish in the water. Uh, this particular cooperative, we've got this thing together now where we can lay nets, catch an amount of fish and also employ quite a considerable amount of people. Well I reckon if we can get the property and the funding to start a proper workshop involving not only electronics which I'm interested in but also people do welding, metalwork, woodwork, um, knitting, uh, flower arrangement, I don't care what, you know, it will be somewhere they can, where they can go and Let's say, improve on the techniques instead of just using the kitchens or a little bit of coal in the spare room to do these things. You'll slowly build up little nucleuses of people who are, who are getting their own thing together bit by bit. Now that may, may not seem much at first, but 
if you, over a period of time, that all comes together and you'll find that, you know, very soon there'll be 100 people employed in small projects like this. Um, now, 100 people already, that's more than the Stoleport is going to employ of, of local people. Shed 4 in the Victoria Dock is one of the largest buildings in Europe without central supports. In the people's plan, it becomes a much needed multi-purpose sports centre. The potential is enormous. There is no lack of ideas. If the Stolport is built, this structure would only be used for storage. We took a group, I think we took about 12 teenage boys there to see what they thought of it because there are ideas going around about it becoming a sports centre. Well, when we got there, they were absolutely amazed. We took a couple of footballs with us, and for a, well, they didn't play the footballs first of all. They were just walking around and saying what could happen in there. They could make a couple of football pitches. There could be tennis courts. There could be um, badminton, all the small ball games plus football. And outside, there's the land there to build um, more tennis courts. BMX tracks, I mean, BMX tracks, in fact, is what they were all saying, you know, this is what we want, skating rinks, pool. It's, it's, just, it's just the most ideal place to have a sports and leisure centre. It's no good um, saying, oh, that's a dream, you, you can't have that. But if you, if you get together and you, you can make a dream a reality, it might be a dream, it might be a dream in somebody's head this afternoon, two or three years' time, it could be there, it could be built. I mean, we've got all, the, all this land, we've got all this water, and there's the LDDC trying to take it away from us, and we're fighting to keep it. If the Stolport is built, many of the projects in the People's Plan will never be realised. People in Docklands have always fought against planners who ignore their demands. Recently, local women campaigned against the tower blocks. This kind of action on a wider scale will be needed to fight for our right to plan the future. Well, we heard that they were holding a meeting and they was going to talk about Pure State. So we'd come up with a big idea, we'd go up there and listen. And we went up there peacefully with our children. But then when we get up there, they started being a bit snotty, wouldn't let us in. So anyway, we get in, gets up in the public gallery. We're sitting quiet, but they started, um, the Pure State people all get their husbands off their backsides and get out to work. We're nothing but second class scum. So we have done our nut, we have thrown leaflets and everything else over at them. They evicted us. <laughs> well, it carried on over a period of years, you know, when we fought. And the GLC just didn't want to know. I think if they were still GLC blocks, we would still be there now. Mm. Because they definitely didn't want to know. They'd have waited until they literally fell down. And then Norm took us over, and they seemed a little bit more sympathetic. They did listen, and we called a big meeting between the GLC and Norm and all the tenants. You know, and that turned into a right fiasco, didn't it? Another war. God, it, it nearly ended up in a fight at that meeting. You know, the things that they have said. They actually wanted to put the scaffolding up round those blocks while we were living in them and knock all the sides of the walls out. So we turned around and said, well, as fast as they can put the scaffolding up, we can dismantle it. And they had no chance. So they went away and had to rethink. And they came up with the answer. The only way that they were going to do anything was to get us out. So it all started from there. You know, once we, we let them know, know them, that we meant business and they didn't like it, so they knew they had to get us out and they started getting people out just after. The campaign was eventually successful, but the building of the tower blocks was not originally seen as a blunder. Do you remember what people were thinking when the tower blocks started going up? Oh, it was great when they first started building it. It was a novelty. You know, the, Everyone wanted to live in the tower block at the time. But, um, it was the people that came out of prefabs and all that sort of thing that actually went in the tower blocks to start with. And it was after a few years, really, that people started to think, you know, it's no good for the children and all this. It, it was great at first. I remember them building them. Because we had great planners, terrific planners. I think most of them must commit suicide because it seems to be the easy way out. And I don't go too much about uh, what's gone on in the past. I think it was economic planning. It was done at that particular time without any uh, worry about what the people want. 
because the people in this area didn't want to be warehoused, but they bloody well warehoused them. The people in this area do want parks. We do want swimming baths. We do want open-air swimming pools. We do want environment for the children. But they tell us, well, you don't really want it, do you? We do want the streets full of trees. Why not? They've got it in St John's Wood. They've got it at Wanstead. They've got it in Woodford. And that was only of us. That was only of us. It only happens to be that I live in a different area. Uh, I believe I have got a right. The same as everyone stands up in the House of Commons because he takes the oath of allegiance, he considers he's got rights. And if he's got rights to move legislation, then I've got rights to say what I'm going to have in my own area. And I think it can be done by the, all the political elements. They all, at the end of the day, must uh, mean what they say. That's what they're going to do is for the good of the people. If that is so, then they should be getting together. The People's Plan is a unique opportunity for local people to be involved in planning for their community. It will have to be fought for.